Hello and welcome to Inside Intelligence, brought to you by the Intelligence Analysis Program and the Johns Hopkins University Office of Advanced Academic Programs. Today's event features David Kamian discussing chat GPT and intelligence analysis. My name is Peter Huggins and I'm the event producer. Please note, today's program will be recorded and uploaded to the AAP YouTube channel under the MS in Intelligence Analysis playlist. During the program, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function, and we will answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A portion of the event. For more information on the MS in Intelligence Analysis program, please visit advanced.jhu.edu forward slash intelligence analysis. With that, I will turn over the event to a moderator, Dr. Michael Ard, Program Director and Senior Lecturer for the Master of Science in Intelligence Analysis Program. Thank you very much, Peter, and hi, everyone. Welcome to our program today. OpenAI's natural language processing tool, ChatGPT, has generated an unprecedented level of excitement over the possibility of how artificial intelligence can communicate in a human-like fashion and potentially improve cognitive tasks. It has also generated fear and an open letter that we should pause AI development in order to save civilization. Today, we are talking about artificial intelligence and the role it plays and may eventually play in intelligence analysis. And to explain it all, our guest today is David Camion, the CEO and founder of Mind Alliance Systems, which builds custom intelligence and knowledge management solutions for global law firms, corporations, and governments. Before founding Mind Alliance Systems, uh, David consulted with Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, and Motorola. He also served as editor of McGraw-Hill Homeland Security Handbook, Strategic Guidance for a communicated, uh, coordinated approach to effective security and emergency management. David has led engagements for the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the World Bank, the Rockefeller Foundation, and NATO. He has also published articles about security and knowledge management as presented at conferences organized by the ODNI, the International Association for Intelligence Education, and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. David received a BA in Eastern Asian and General Studies from Hebrew University of Jerusalem and a law degree from the Academic College of Law in Ramat Gan. David, welcome today to our program. Thanks for uh, being here and uh, being willing to talk to us. So I'm going to just mention to our audience uh, that uh, we will be taking your questions in about the second part of our program. Please put your questions in the Q&A function and leave the chat for uh, any other uh, uh, comment you want to have on uh, David's presentation. Thanks very much. And David, I'll turn it over to you now. Well, first of all, thank you, Michael. It's, it's great to be with you, and it's a very timely topic. I'm going to share my screen because I think it'll be fun to look at some examples of Chat GPT in action as we go through uh, today's webinar. So, right off the bat, I want to make sure that uh, people realize that we're not evangelizing chat GPT specifically. There are other GPT, there are other large language models out there. We'll talk about a few of them. And um, these tools have great potential for intelligence analysis, but let's not forget they are not intelligent. Uh, they're, they're, they are not capable of reasoning, and it's really important to address the risks. And we'll talk about some of those risks today. Mike, can you hear me? Hear you great. Awesome. So um, this is not a new topic. The intelligence community, the Department of Defense has been interested in AI. Think tanks have been interested in AI and its role in intelligence for a long, long time. And as far back as, I think it's 1954, the DOD demonstrated automated translation from Russian to English. Um, and as I mentioned, there are various companies that have created these large language models. Uh, OpenAI and ChatGPT is getting a lot of the press. Um, have you played with the GPT-4 yet, Mike? 
I have. And what do you think? Well, I think it, I mean, the, uh, the language processing is very impressive. Um, it's very fast. Uh, oftentimes it comes up with uh, reasonable sounding answers, uh, but sometimes it's inaccurate. And do you understand what the large and large language models is? Maybe we should explain that a little bit. I, I would like an explanation of it. So the large refers to the number of parameters and the, the, the size of the corpus that the uh, machine learning model is trained on. These models are trained on vast amount of text. And um, obviously that gives it incredible pattern recognition and it can predict um, uh, what, what, uh, what text to generate, right? That's where the, the generative, uh, in generative AI comes, comes from. Um, and they get better when they are um, trained with, when, when there's human feedback. And so reinforcement learning from human feedback is an important concept. I think it goes back to 2017, OpenAI uh, published a paper on that. And it's through that feedback from humans that the model gets better and aligned with what humans consider uh, to be, you know, high value or the goals and uh, addresses, you know, all sorts of issues that uh, are also getting a lot of press. And you're familiar with the term prompt. So the prompt is what you tell the chat bot to do. Um, it could be a question, but it doesn't have to be a question. As you'll see, when we go into examples, you could actually say, you know, create a table with column A showing this and column B showing that, and we'll, we'll demonstrate that. So these large language models are being used for all sorts of dif different use cases. Um, they've been used in customer support chatbots. You can use it to help you write. We'll see some examples of that. All sorts of different kinds of marketing use cases. Summarization, uh, which clearly can help intelligence analysts deal with mass volumes of text and even write software code. So our software team at Mind Alliance now uses uh, tools to help them generate code as well as to write code from scratch. And here on the right, you're seeing uh, an image from Bing. I promise not to just focus on OpenAI and ChatGPT. And what's unique here, or well, not really unique anymore because now some people have access to a version of ChatGPT that does this. You're not just getting an answer, you're getting the sources. So you see what are Vladimir Putin's favorite restaurants? I don't know if it's true, but Bing thinks it knows the answer and uh, has some sources for that. Um, there are even tools coming out that are sort of add-ons to your browser. So you don't even have to think up the prompt, APRM being one of them. So these are prompts that have been created by uh, people called prompt engineers. Really anyone can create one. And the one on the upper left here apparently has gotten 1.7 million uses just in the last couple of months, which is kind of amazing how quickly that works. So I imagine you'd like us to, to get to the point where we talk about how this thing relates to intelligence analysis, right? Um, a person I respect greatly, Sir David Oman, who had who was the head of GCHQ, and I have have spoken about uh, GPT, and um, we, you know we we were trying to see how it applies to the various uh, ways he he describes as thinking like a spy, ordering our thoughts, checking our reasoning, and making intelligent use of intelligence. And I think we're going to be able to see GPT do some of those things. Here are another couple of things that. The Rand Corporation um, looked into when it comes to applying AI systems to intelligence analysis. So, without further ado, why don't we start taking a look at some of the uh, different phases of the intelligence cycle and uh, how you know tools like GPT can can work. So here I'm 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 going to play a video, and I I do have GPT open, so we can also do a live demo of GPT so people uh, can see it in action live. So here I'm asking GPT to tell us, to come up with some questions. This is obviously part of the planning and direction phase of intelligence cycle. You know, okay, the secretary of state is gonna meet with uh, a Russian counterpart, talk about the new START treaty. 
what does the Secretary of State need to know going into that meeting? So at the beginning, the answers are pretty meh, right? Pretty basic. You know, no senior, no, this is not going to wow any national intelligence officer at the NIC. But as it, I, I press it for more details, um, it does manage to get uh, um, far more detailed. So I'll jump ahead in the video. And I actually, it even apologizes for, for providing broad responses. So now it's going to give me the second level down because I asked it for sub questions. And I keep pressing it for more specific. Uh, questions and it does it. So if you see, it's giving me the current status of Russian's new, new nuclear arsenal as a topic and then question, sub question and so, and so on. That's already pretty good. What do you think? Yeah, it's great. I mean, the, uh, it's amazing the amount of detail I was able to cover. Of course, you have to go through these to make sure that uh, they all make sense. But yeah, it was, it was an impressive response. For sure. For sure. So uh, so, so, so before we move on from planning and direction as an intelligence phase, I think we can kind of summarize that and say, you know, GPT was able to come up with some, some good specific questions. Um, and, and that's pretty awesome. One can imagine um, the intelligence community creating a corpus of really good questions. And obviously they could be vetted by senior analysts. You can imagine feeding it documents and saying, what questions do these documents answer? And populating the corpus of questions that way. So that's planning and direction. I don't know if we'll have time to go over all phases, but let's talk about collection for a moment. So here I'm asking GPT uh, about specific data sources that would answer the questions that it generated before. And it, it, it again, it gives me a pretty generic answer in the beginning. It's not going to wow any analyst at DIA or CIA or anywhere else. But, uh, you know, I dig in and I, and I ask for more. In fact, I ask for specific job titles and agency and department names of potential, uh, you know, assets that could be recruited as human sources. And here, we already are starting to get into the danger zone of hallucination. So I'm not, maybe you can tell, but I'm not a Soviet uh, nuclear uh, intelligence expert. So, uh, but, but, but uh, a quick research showed that some of these titles, some of these organizations might be quote unquote hallucinated. So hallucination is when basically it's not grounded in, in actual facts. So on collection side, you know, um, we're going to talk about a way to mitigate this a little bit later, but um, definitely there's a risk for hallucination. Summarization, not so much. It's pretty, if you feed it an article and say, summarize this article or generate questions and answers based on this article, it'll do it. And as far as I can tell, the risk of summarization is pretty low. Another task which could help analysts is table building, right? Make me a table. Again, if you're asking it to generate the table, um, it, it could make things up. We, we, I did a little uh, research about uh, this stuff. Um, yeah, some of it is inaccurate um, and that's problematic. But if you were to feed it data, and this is, this is not problematic, if you feed it data and say, make a table out of this, then, uh, it's pretty good. So summarization, you could also create a timeline. Obviously, if you've got massive intercepted uh, amount of text or a massive volume of intelligence reports, I mean, would this have helped you back when you were in the IC? Yes. I mean, uh, you know, it, at first blush, it looks like this could have been a very useful tool. Obviously, it would have to be trained on the classified data that we use. Exactly. Now, there are other risks. We'll talk about more risks as we go along, but one of them is poisoning. So an adversary could inject false information into the training data, right? So if you're the IC or anyone else and you're training on public information, that public information could create, could contain intentionally false misleading information that would part of the uh, you know, a deception operation or, or, or something more 
specific. Well, now let's get to the kind of what I consider the heart of intelligence, which is the analysis uh, phase, analysis and production. And here, it's pretty exciting to see the US intelligence community and more specifically IARPA, the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity, looking for tools to help analysts with their reasoning and their report production. So the, the reason is an acronym, Rapid Explanation Analysis and Sourcing Online. It's pretty recent and there are videos about this um, on YouTube and the IARPA website is easy to find. And what they wanna do for intelligence analysts is sort of analogous to a Grammarly uh, grammar checker for writers. They want to analyze the text that you're writing and help you find evidence that either supports or contradicts your, 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 your argument and obviously improve the quality of the report. Now, IARPA usually and DARPA uh, as its uh, kind of sister agency is usually looking for stuff that's you know, five years out, uh, DARPA hard, you know, sort of beyond the here and now of technology. But in a moment, I'm gonna show you a tool which seems to be pretty close to uh, what Reason is looking for, uh, which is inspiring. Um, so on the plus side, on the positive side, um, analysts would definitely benefit from having this really high quality corpus of analytic questions to ask, right, about entities or events and, you know, help writing reports. Um, but the moment you ask a generative AI to generate an answer, you're at risk of hallucinating if you're letting it run wild on the training material and it, it's not a controlled corpus. But you can imagine some other things. Um, have you ever done red teaming, Mike? I'm sure you, you have. Uh, you yeah. wanna explain what that means in a minute, or, you know, briefly for, for other yeah, I mean, you're, you're basically acting like, you know, you're thinking like the adversary, you know, how, how could you penetrate a system? How could you uh, attack an argument? Uh, exactly. What, yeah, so, that's the type of red teaming that we do. That's that's great, and and that's what I'm going to try and show in a moment with uh, a, another tool. So again, you've got the issues of hallucination, um, and you've got a problem that at least until recently, GPT was only uh, aware of its training data, but that actually is changing, and certainly intelligence agencies have the budget and the ability to connect up their data sources. So a little bit later, I'll show how you can uh, basically overcome this issue. Some of the other issues we talked about, but a new issue I wanna mention is confirmation bias. So it's, it's all too easy to uh, over depend on a tool like this and to look for confirming evidence. So. Here's a tool, it's a little bit small, but I've got it open on a uh, browser. It's from an Israeli company called Open, uh, sorry, AI21 Labs. Mm -hmm. And um, this tool um, goes beyond helping you write. They've got a tool that helps you with the grammar, but they actually have this um, feature called Spice. And so you can write something and then hit this button, add Spice, and it will do various analytic tasks for you. And one of them is counter argument. So when I hit counter argument, it gave me a sort of quick and dirty little counter argument for what I wrote. So this already is kind of showing you what the user experience for an intelligence analyst could look like, right? You could have your Microsoft Word or whatever WYSIWYG editor you've got open, and then you'd have, um, you know, a toolbar or a menu or a way to basically ask the, the, the AI to do something useful for you from, from an analytic perspective. Um, so I've got a little surprise for you, Mike. Uh, where did you go to college? Well, what's the true answer? College of William Mary. Right, well, unfortunately, uh, as of when, when I created this screenshot a day or two ago, uh, ChatGPT did not know where you went to college, even though anyone could look that up on LinkedIn or uh, on, on your bio. So what, what do we do about that, right? Um, ChatGPT is going to be connected, is connected, uh, but not everyone has access to this, to the internet. 
So how do you deal with that, right? And how do you deal with you know, the quality of the information that it's trained on? So we have uh, uh, clients, we work with law firms that are actually asking themselves these questions now because it goes without saying that they wanna leverage this technology responsibly, right? So they can't you know, provide hallucinated answers to their clients. So there is an architecture that enables you to deal with this. And essentially what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your private database and you're gonna index that. And you're going to use data from that search results from your private data as part of the prompt that you send to, for example, OpenAI or AI21 Labs or any other uh, vendor you work with who, who brings the model to the table. So the model, the generative model is, is going to generate an answer based on the data that you provide in the prompt, which is the search results. So I don't wanna to get too technical, but basically this is a way for you to leverage its ability to understand intent, understand what, the, what you're asking it to do, and it'll use your content. So I, I won't say that this is a fully solved problem, but there are definitely going to be solutions to deal with the problems of outdated knowledge and hallucination, uh, but there are many other problems and I hope we have time to talk about some of them. Uh, one of them is explainability, uh, but let me see if you wanna take the conversation in uh, any particular direction. Well, um, okay, what do you think about the library of lies? Is that uh, different than poisoning? Yeah, so um, my friend Mark Pfeiffer uh, talked to me about Library of Lies. Um, he and I are going to be giving a, a training workshop in Greece for uh, intelligence managers on how to actually responsibly use this stuff. And uh, yeah, it is different because the poisoning has to do with an adversary injecting false information, mm -hmm. uh, misleading information into your training data. I think. Um, Library of Lies is, is sort of more specific um, where you're going to manage this corpus of, of, of lies and uh, as an adversary um, as, as, as such. So they're similar, not quite, uh, maybe Library of Lies is more relevant to like a disinformation campaign um, that could be used. Mark, Mark says it's a collection of known lies. Yeah, it's a collection of, of known lies that an, an intelligence agency have discovered to be lies, but they were put there possibly intentionally, right, right. by an adversary. So right. yeah, he's right. And uh, I hope that, that clarifies a That's bit good. more. That's good, thank you. So there are many other issues um, with large language models because of the way they are built um, and um, I wanna to touch a bit upon the explainability issue because it's gonna help us uh, clarify something really, really important about the future of AI and the risk of AI taking over the world. And my friend, Dr. Walid Saba is, is a very vocal exponent about how uh, machines um, will not rule the world actually there's a great book about this by uh, Job Slangreb and Barry Smith, quite technical, not light reading, but basically they, they, they provide a mathematical argument about why a true AGI is never going to happen. I don't wanna to get too much into that argument. Um, you can find uh, information about that on the web, but I do wanna emphasize this notion of explainability, not ever truly happening if you're only gonna use machine learning. And that's because it's, uh, you can't re reverse your steps. You, th there's some statistical correlation, right? Between some pattern of language and what would follow, but it's not based on a causal mo a model or a understanding of how the world works in a causal sense. Um, and to get to that explainability, you, almost have to go back to good old fashioned AI, which uses techniques uh, known as knowledge representation and reasoning, which is a symbolic approach. And we won't get too technical here, but basically you're dealing with um, 
a, 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 the potential to explain because everything is formally modeled and the machine is reasoning over that. Now, the neurosymbolic approach, more jargon, is trying to combine these two approaches. And that's where things get really interesting. But before we get too far away from risks, I wanna emphasize how important it is to take a multidisciplinary approach to mitigating these risks. The risks of using large language models for intelligence analysis, it cannot be just addressed by technology guys, okay? You, you need an interdisciplinary approach because unless you understand cognitive psychology and all sorts of other uh, you know, scientific domains, you're, you're not going to be able to preemptively mitigate some of these risks. And I find this really interesting as a topic um, and have for many years because it's multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary, right? And it, and it raises questions about you know, what it means to know something and what is truth. And it's, it's, it's endlessly interesting. So um, we can dig deeper into uh, any of the topics that we covered, but why don't we have some fun and actually do some chat GPT prompts? Let's, yeah, uh, let's do that. You know, uh, yeah, we have time and then we'll, um, in a few minutes, we'll get to uh, some of the questions from our audience and there's a number of them. So yeah, let's, um, let's do a prompt. Okay. Um, why, don't we, why don't we do a live example uh, that relates to what we showed in earlier about planning and direction? Like what are the questions we should ask? Do you want to kind of give me a hypothetical scenario that will feed in and say, you know, what would a person in this situa si situation need to know? You want me to make one up? Um, why don't we talk about Let's say something that's been on a lot of people's minds lately or is uh, Iran's nuclear program. What would be, for example, um, say indications that maybe they're going to move to uh, weaponize their nuclear program? Okay, so I'm not a great typer, typist, but let's try it. What events would indicate that Iran is moving towards uh, operationalizing its nuclear missile or, capability, or making a nuclear making a nuclear weapon. Yes. Okay, better. Making a nuclear weapon, and let's not forget that one of the cool things about the conversational AI that we're playing with is that you can drill in and you can give it more direction. It remembers the context of the conversation before. Now I just noticed that I used ChatGPT 3.5, which is not as uh, right. capable as ChatGPT 4. So let me just copy that and rerun it with ChatGPT 4. It might be interesting to compare the answers, but let's just focus in on the GPT 4 answer. So just, I mean, first of all, it's astounding how quickly it's capable of coming up with things, right? It's just it's generating this, right? It's not right. retrieving the answer, you know, from keywords from a, from a corpus of right. documents that have been indexed. It's writing this stuff, which is kind right. of amazing. So I have a sense that it's going to give us a pretty obvious answer in the beginning. Yes. We're going to have to nudge it to give us something more specific, but let's see. Interesting that GPT is uh, kind of hedging a little bit or pointing out that they don't necessarily confirm the development of a nuclear weapon, but they raise suspicions right. and they're potential indicators. And I didn't ask for potential indicators. No. Right, although I, I said would indicate, but okay. Okay. All right, now we can stop it. I don't know how much longer it's gonna go. I could have said, give us 10 indicators or five indicators and it would have given us yeah, a specific right. number. Um, do you want to try going deeper into any one of these? Because I can say, you know, give me more detail about number five. Yeah, okay, let's do that. Okay.
Oh, and yes, this does sometimes happen. Uh, there are, you know, millions of people hitting GPT One, constantly. Yeah, there's a lot. That's That's been coming up a lot with this. I think all the uh, platforms, um, Bard for Google um, has been, you know, you I had to uh, get on a waiting list to use it. Um, so there's there's been a, a little bit of that, but it, it's interesting how much curiosity this has uh, uh, provoked. So I'm, I'm quickly creating a new prompt using number five, and I'm saying what would indicate that Iran is expanding its centrifuge capability. Okay. Okay, let's see what it can do with that. And hopefully we're not shut out. Oh, we're back to 3.5. That's on me. Sorry about that. But it's answering. And right, it's models. really not massively different. Right. From 3.5 to 4. Well, we can see, though, where this is an outstanding brainstorming tool. Exactly. If you're, you know, especially exactly. if you're working by, on your own. Yeah. Right. Um, okay, so that was... Uh, you know, planning and direction. We want right. want to give it a, a sort of a more analytical prompt, and don't be afraid to 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 let's 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 we can make it hallucinate, right? We can ask right. it a direct question and see see the problematic aspect of hallucination. Uh, can it be forward thinking? Do you think that's a great question? You want to you want to ask a question about let's see the same who, topic domain? Yes, who's going to win the NF? Uh, who's going to win the NFL Super Bowl two thousand and twenty four? <laughs> How does it handle that? Let's see. I'm sorry, but as an AI language model, I cannot predict future events. Okay, right. that's not that's not fun. No, but let's ask it an analytic question relating to Iran and see what it comes up with. Uh, does Iran intend to uh, a, uh, build a nuclear weapon? And remember that the training here ended, I think it was 2020. Right, 2001, right? 2021, 2001, maybe? Yeah. Right. So here it's so it's not a flat yes or no answer, and um, now why don't we why don't we use this uh, moment to ask it to create a table because I want to show that capability it's pretty useful right okay then then I think we'll move to questions absolutely generate a table with. Uh, Three columns. Um, with arguments for and against the claim that Iran plans to build a nuclear weapon. Now, I'm not being super clear. I could have say in column A, put in you know the topic or the area, it does that well. I wanna see if it can understand what to put in each column. Mm -hmm. Interesting. It decided right. to create a, a neutral arguments column and I didn't ask it to do that. Um, That's very good. Yeah, but look how fast it did it. So. As a tool to help analysts just quickly think through different aspects of things, it could be interesting. And just imagine that you've got that corpus of questions that the IC could create. And it's also going to kind of give you the ability to dig in deeper on any of these things you want. So prompting you, prompting you the analyst, to with, with potential prompts to, to, to dig deeper. So best analytic practices could somehow be embodied in prompts and collections of prompts. 
and warnings to analysts that are presented as they write, as they read. And I think it has a lot of potential. Let's turn over to the questions. Great. Um, I'm going to, uh, one that's come up a number of times in the Q&A has been about uh, hallucinations and why that happens. And, you know, if we think that this is something that's going to be very easy to correct. Well, it happens because the AI is trained on uh, a large corpus of information, which may or may not be factual. And what it's doing is not technically retrieving, you know, an answer to your question or to your prompt. It's generating an answer to your question. It's predicting, given your prompt, what would humans expect to see? In other words, statistically, what words would follow, what tokens would follow uh, what you've typed or pasted as a prompt? Um, so that's why it happens. Um, and since you know the training material may not be factual, um, and since it's generating stuff, it's you know highly uh, risky to uh, rely on the uh, generated information. But as we we, we said, if we um, if we give it a piece of content, right, and we and we say you know, based on this, you know, what is the answer to this question? When will Iran have a nuclear weapon? So if we go to Google and ask this, um, right, and we, we take an article, which perhaps we consider factual, let's not get into that right now. But if we take this article, and we use this as, as an input. Am I managing to copy, right? Now let's find something that's being claimed here. Um, okay, so you can see Iranian diplomats for years have pointed to blah, 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 preaching as a follow as religi re religious edict that Iran wouldn't seek an atomic bomb. So when we ask the G, uh, chat GPT a question, you know, do, do Iran's clerics support the building of a nuclear bomb? And we say, Based on the text that follows, let's see if it hallucinates or if it bases it on this article. So interestingly, it's saying that it doesn't provide clear evidence. And arguably that's true just because they say <laughs> They don't support it doesn't mean that that's true, um, but it points out that it notes. Yeah, interestingly, it didn't it didn't provide the quote from that uh, that specific uh, part of the article. It's mm -hmm. not a quote, but this specific point. Now, what if we take this, all right? And we say, as based on the article above, has the Serena Khomeini preached? against building a nuclear weapon. Yeah, so now it's getting it right mm -hmm. and it's basing it on the article. So again, if you feed it the right prompt material, you can uh, mitigate uh, the risk of hallucination to I think a large degree. That gets back to 
the architecture that I was talking about, and there can be many architectures for this, but this is our take on it, which is if, if, you, if you are basing the prompt on information that you supply from your private database, and you're using the language model to essentially answer based on that, then you're on you know, more solid ground. More questions uh, yeah. from our audience today. Have you seen an AI tool that can deconstruct an argument? By deconstruct, I assume uh, the person is asking about uh, counter arguing or you know, building a counter argument or break it down into more detailed components. I think, I think that GPT can, can build an argument um, generatively. Again, obviously the hallucination risk is there. Let me, let me prove that or, or let's say try it out um, so people can see. I've played with this before, uh, mm -hmm. but let's say uh, give me pros and cons to use in a debate about whether Iran will have a nuclear uh, weapon by 2024. While we watch yeah, this generate, yeah. I'll just yeah. make a quick point. Um, my wife asked me, like, why only now? Like, why are we only seeing these incredible large language models now, right, in, in 2023 and, and, and recent years? And part of the answer is that we now have compute power, right, in the cloud and, and you know, purpose-built, um, you know, um, chips for gra you know, graphic processing units that can handle the incredible amount of compute uh, required. I mean, who knows how many millions of people right now are hitting the open AI servers mm -hmm. with, with prompts. And I, I didn't spend any time on this back when we were talking about some of the is issues. So we talked about hallucination, we talked about explainability. We didn't talk about some other aspects which matter uh, to the world. Uh, there's a tremendous uh, you know, impact on the climate, on all of the heat that's generated in the server farms that are running the millions of computers that are not only training the models, but also responding to prompts like the one that we just asked, right? So you have computers somewhere in some data center chugging away and generating heat while it's answering this stuff. Anyway, here we've got our answer. And I think it was able to yeah. uh, generate an argument. So I think it is capable of generating arguments. And uh, um, I think I could easily put this into a table if I wanted. Let's get to another question that um, Barry asked about, um, you know, the, the requirement for analysts to explain, be able to explain the underlying data methodologies of an assessment. How can we then, uh, if we don't really understand what GPT does and how it does it, in other words, where it's getting information from, how it's coming upon that, uh, how can we get away with just saying, well, the algorithm you know, came up with this? So what, you know, are we gonna be stuck with just sort of blind faith in the algorithm on some of our analytic uh, calls? That's exactly uh, the right question to ask. Um, we, we mustn't go down that path of blindly believing what a generative AI with no explainability generates. I think the path forward ultimately is a combination of neurosymbolic, the neurosymbolic AI I referred to before that combines the vector-based approach, machine learning, it's based on statistics and patterns and predictions of the tokens and the knowledge representation and reasoning approach. So um, we don't want our analysts to, to just trust a machine that generates answers. We want our analysts to, to reason based on deep, profound understanding about how uh, the world works. And in fact, you know, ICD-203 
which is the intelligence community directive that deals with intelligence analysts, this, this gets to the heart of what we want from analysts. Why, you know, we consider them professionals as opposed to people who are just, you know, surmising what must happen, you know, what might happen and, and why they think that. So I'll zoom in here, but it's very important for anyone who deploys um, tools like ChatGPT or any of the others to support analysis to ensure that these analytic tradecraft standards are upheld because, you know, heaven help us if we, we don't because then we're just going to be, uh, you know, drowning in more uh, questionable information. And the ability to track your assumptions in time and see if they prove out is going to be very important. Uh, we've designed uh, software in the past for intelligence analysts, which give you the ability to set a reminder, essentially, to check whether a forward-looking statement, in fact, proves to be true. Mm -hmm. um, this is not a simple topic, right? I, I talked about mm -hmm. the importance of applying multiple disciplines to this. Um, it's going to touch upon how intelligence analysts are trained, um, how they're evaluated, um, and you know there 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 might be a generational aspect to this as you know the digital natives uh, become senior analysts they may mm -hmm. have more tolerance for you know integrating technology into the analytic workflow. Um, it's right. it's going to you know it's amazing how fast things change. You know when I put in you know where did Michael Ard go to uh, university. Uh, the first time, and that was with ChatGPT 3.5, I think, it gave me one answer, and, and it's already giving a more accurate answer. Now, when it's plugged into the internet, it'll probably provide an accurate answer, you know, if it can index, um, you know, LinkedIn or, or the Johns Hopkins University bio. And clearly, more and more people throughout their daily life are going to rely more and more and more on, uh, on, on generative AI, whether they call it that or realize it, that that's what it is. So there is a risk, I think, of uh, people who spend you know, much of their private time interacting with AI in their car and on their phone and, and, and various other uh, contexts, um, becoming over-reliant on it, becoming lazy. And I think, it takes a human analyst with the ability to do counterfactual reasoning and imagine what might happen yeah. and to step back um, and question their reasoning. And it takes social interaction between people to create uh, you know, uh, the kind of dynamics that, um, that lead to great intelligence. And we shouldn't, Forget that people make mistakes as well. People are not perfect. Um, but I think there is a potential for integrating large language models into the intelligence cycle. We just need to do it very, very responsibly. And I think that's gonna require training and, and importantly, calibration of expectations. I think that, you know, it's an important point about the digital natives and which, you know, it's a strength and weakness, right? Because people know how to use this technology very well, but then there are some parts of their, you know, their cognitive functions uh, deteriorate because of this, just like relying too much on, um, uh, you know, uh, you know your, your global positioning, right? When you're driving and then you don't really know what your surroundings are. Um, and uh, I mean, even uh, the Navy found that it needed to go back to teaching celestial navigation again to get people, get the sailors to understand how we actually do it rather than just plugging, you know, plugging in your, your plot into a computer. Um, yeah, so, so questions too uh, coming up. And one, uh, one of our listeners asked, 
Um, what about using a, what about using like structured analytic techniques in Chat GPT? Could it be trained to use that? Something like uh, uh, alternative uh, competing hypotheses. That's a great question, and I think uh, the answer is abso absolutely yes. There are a lot of structured analytic techniques. Many of them could be turned into prompts or sequences of prompts, um, and you know. Red team analysis is one of them. And now ACH is, is, is another. Um, mm -hmm. Just for fun, we could um, try it out right now. First of all, let's see if ChatGPT knows what uh, ACH is. So it got the acronym right, and it's giving me steps on how to apply it. And I think it might be too much to ask it to apply it just in one fell swoop, but um, it needs a topic. Yeah, it needs a topic. Yeah, of course. So we're going to give it a topic. So let's give it a prompt along the following lines: using ACH, what, uh, what using H, what could explain the reason for um, Syria to build a nuclear reactor? Okay. So we should get different hypotheses, hopefully. And we did. So these are four hypotheses, right? Right. right? And now once we've identified these hypotheses, we need to gather relevant evidence. Okay. And now it's not actually doing it. Right. Uh, please go ahead and supply evidence for each of the above hypotheses. Now, I am waitlisted for the new GPT-4 uh, link to the internet. So unfortunately, this is not going to utilize that. But let's right. see what it can do with its training data. So here, it's supplying evidence. So this alone, frankly, if you can imagine that if this was using uh, you know, a controlled corpus of information, Mm -hmm. would be extraordinarily valuable for intelligence analysts. And yeah, not a stretch to see at all how it could be, it could learn on ACH and get and weigh and and weigh the um uh the consistency of the different uh pieces of evidence. Um let me ask another question, uh David. Um I mean we we've um uh we've also seen how getting back to the trust trust and reliability of this. Um, we're seeing, for example, in um, uh, Microsoft, they're, it's, it's providing answers with sources. Um, now, I don't think uh, chat GPT has done that yet, have they? Well, they, they, they do now, but unfortunately it's not wi in widespread release okay. yet. Um, so I'm not gonna be able to demo that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's probably a matter of weeks before the uh, they they make that available, I can't speak for them, of course. Right, but yeah, if you're if you're using um, uh, Bing right now, you could you know it'll give you answers with uh, and it'll go to sources. And I think it's using very um, when I've tried it, it's it's used a very very uh, reputable sources to give you to give the answers. So um, another question uh, is, how do you think um, uh, these you know, these uh, language learning tools, how good will they be at spotting misinformation or disinformation? Well, that's a tough question um, because I don't think it's always easy uh, to do that, um, even for humans. Um, why don't we ask ChatGPT and see okay. what it thinks? Let's, let's see what its answer is. See? 
this is already the risk of being over relied on <laughs> right on chat gpt um how good is chat gpt at spotting deliberate disinformation campaigns let's say so I like that it is humble in a certain right. sense. And it's saying, you know, well, I'm not perfect. I think uh, uh, OpenAI um, is trying to behave responsibly. Let's hope that that is in fact the case and continues. Um, but it's making the points that um, I was, uh, thinking, and we've talked about uh, today on the webinar, which is whatever ChatGPT can or cannot do is going to be limited by its training data. And, you know, if, if it doesn't know that, uh, let's say, you know, Mike Ard's new book is actually a great bestseller because you wrote it four years from now, right? It's not going to be able to disprove a claim to the contrary, right? So, you know, it's it's ultimately only as good as its training data for, for many of the use cases that we're talking about. Um, so, but this is going to change, right? The chat GPT does not have access, real-time access to the internet, that's going to change. Um, are there any other questions? Um, I think there's, um, you know, we, we have a lot of great discussion here in the chat about the potential for this. Um, one of the things I'd uh, recommend that uh, everybody do who is interested in this is, and, you know, ask your own questions, but also ask questions where you think you already have a pretty good understanding of, what, of the knowledge and see how well it does compared to what you understand uh, the quest, you know, the answer to be. Um, when I was uh, playing around with it, I found that a lot of times it got facts right. Uh, sometimes, as we mentioned, it hallucinated others or made up some, um, unfortunately. Um, and it had a little trouble, I thought, with uh, getting an, on sort of the tacit knowledge side of it. In other words, it, it understood the data or the basic facts, but really like getting down deep into what happened, um, it was not as, as clear on that. For sure. We're, these are still, I would say, early days in this process. Um, I know the table of contents of a book I edited, um, and I just asked it what topics are covered in that book, and it did a pretty good job. I wonder if I kept on drilling in how complete it would be. Yeah. Um, I, I do think that um, there, there, are, there are plenty of uh, uh, applications for uh, you know, this technology. Um, I remember when we did a project for the Center for Strategic and International Studies called the Trusted Information Network, where they were basically trying to show the, the utility of uh, analytic outreach uh, in the context of open source intelligence. They built a, a network of terrorism experts um, and they asked them questions once a month. And by the end of the year, they had a massive corpus of answers um, to those monthly questions, but sometimes the answers covered more than one topic. And the uh, analyst who worked on that project told me how time consuming it was to go through that massive information and categorize the answers by topic so they could write up this report. And so those kinds of uh, time saving devices hopefully will free up an analyst to spend more time on strategic foresight analysis and cultivating a profound understanding of the intelligence customer and maybe revising the intelligence priorities that are in focus, harmonizing and coordinating efforts across agencies. These are things which also the, uh, you know, machine learning based models can help with, but you they're political. You have to have humans interacting with humans in order to, uh, to really make it happen. 
You have to that's build great. trust. Uh, David, I think that's a great way for us to wrap up tonight, uh, today's program. Um, thank you very much for this outstanding presentation. I uh, really uh, shed a lot of light on what is obviously a, in some ways an obscure and fascinating topic. Uh, we also thank our audience for the great turnout today and the excellent questions. Wish we could have gotten to them all, but um, if you want to uh, catch up uh, with the program, um, we're going to have a recording on it uh, posted on our uh, Johns Hopkins AAP YouTube channel in a day or two. So check that out along with other recordings that we have there if you're interested. And uh, David, uh, last thing, uh, do you uh, is there, did you say you got a contact that you wanted to share? So yeah, thank you very much for letting me uh, plug an event. Um, Mark Pfeiffer and I are going to be uh, training uh, intelligence managers uh, and, and others on uh, how to use this stuff responsibly. Uh, we're gonna have a, sort of a classroom style two-day workshop. First one will be in Athens. We'll do an, another one in uh, New York or DC. Maybe we'll do three. First one will be in September and essentially you know, you'll show up with your laptop and we're gonna get hands-on and practical in uh, using some of these tools. Probably won't restrict it to chat GPT, but that'll be one of the tools. And I think it'll be, um, it'll be very interesting. So I encourage people to check it out at aiosint.com. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, and also I'll remind our uh, viewers today that our next program in May uh, will be on alternative analysis uh, with Jay Oki, and do a uh, look out for, uh, for that. Um, that will be, a, uh, typical, I think that'll be what, the 11th of May um, at uh, noontime, Peter. But um, anyway, just take a look uh, in your inbox for that um, at uh, 10th of May, and uh, thanks. And so we'll uh, be talking about how uh, alternative analysis can hunt for strategic surprises with, with Jay Oki. And uh, thank, again, uh, David, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, uh, happy Passover, happy Easter, everyone. And um, we'll see you next time on Inside Intelligence. Thanks very much. It was a pleasure speaking with you, Michael. Thank you.